Now to Russia, where four men accused in Friday's deadly terror attack in Moscow were taken to court over the weekend, appearing badly bruised and battered. Russia says three have admitted their guilt. ISIS also released video they claim shows the start of the assault, which killed more than 130 people. It's the deadliest terror attack in Russia in nearly 20 years. The lives of many families, including children, parents, and other relatives, have been altered for life by the actions of a few men. Allegedly, these few men were led by a religious dogma that enabled them to kill. Their recent attack took place on Russia's soil just days after Putin's powerful speech following his victory in the elections. What motivated it? Did the US or Ukraine have a hand in this? And how has Russia handled this catastrophe is all we are about to find out. Sit tight, but be ready for a ride filled with revelations you didn't know existed after we examine the new videos of Russia's terrorists, which are going viral. The viral video. We are in a concert in Crocus City. Here is a shot of a gun. A lot of people are running. All of them are shooting. Someone is shooting here. During the weekend of Friday, March 22nd, Russia experienced the deadliest attack on its soil in years. In a shocking turn of events, a concert at Crocus City Hall in Moscow turned into a scene of terror and tragedy. The night was supposed to be one for music and celebration at Crocus City Hall, a renowned entertainment complex on the outskirts of Moscow. The auditorium, with its seating capacity of 6,200, was nearly filled to the brim as excited concert goers eagerly awaited the performance of the Picnic Group, a band that had captured the hearts of the Soviet generation since the early 1980s. The atmosphere was electric, with anticipation hanging in the air. As the clock ticked closer to 8 p.m., the scheduled start time of the show, the auditorium was about three quarters full. Some attendees were still making their way to their seats, while others were grabbing a quick bite or shedding their heavy coats in the cloakroom. But little did they know that this night would soon turn into a nightmare. It was approximately seven, ten minutes before the show was set to begin, when the tranquility was shattered by a series of popping sounds. At first the crowd was puzzled, mistaking the noise for fireworks. Initially I thought it was just some fireworks or something like that, said Dave Primoff, a concert goer who had been looking forward to this night for weeks. He added, I looked at my colleague and he also said fireworks, probably. However, their assumptions were quickly shattered as the true horror unfolded. At least four men, dressed in khaki attire and armed with automatic weapons, had infiltrated the building. Without warning, they began firing incessantly, their shots echoing through the auditorium. Panic and confusion gripped the crowd as they realized that this was no ordinary spectacle. The concert hall, once filled with joyous anticipation, transformed into a scene of chaos and terror. People screamed and scrambled for cover, desperately seeking an escape from the hail of bullets. Amidst the chaos, the gunmen showed no mercy. Their bullets found their targets, leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. And then, in a horrifying twist, they set the concert hall ablaze, trapping those inside in a deadly inferno. The once vibrant and joyous atmosphere was now consumed by fear and desperation. Survivors would later recount the harrowing moments when they hid behind the dark red seats, crawling towards the exits, hoping to find a way out of this nightmare. Videos captured by witnesses in the hallways and auditorium revealed the sheer terror that unfolded that night. People frantically tried to flee, their faces etched with fear as the gunmen continued their relentless assault. Some sought refuge behind the seats, while others crawled on the floor, desperately trying to find an escape route. In one chilling video, a young man, his voice trembling, spoke into the camera amidst the sound of gunshots. They set the auditorium on fire, the auditorium is on fire. For a brief moment, flames could be seen flickering in a corner of the theater, adding to the horror that had already unfolded. Amidst the chaos and uncertainty, Dave Primov and others managed to escape the auditorium before the gunmen reached it. It took them approximately 25 minutes to navigate their way out of the building entirely, a journey fraught with danger and confusion. While describing the traumatic 25-minute ordeal, Primov said, It was complete chaos. People were running, trying to find exits. Gunmen were still roaming through the building, firing their weapons. We didn't know what lay ahead, what was behind each door. The fear of being encircled by the attackers or encountering more danger was overwhelming. Another survivor who identified herself only as Maria echoed Primov's sentiments, describing the pervasive uncertainty that gripped everyone present. In her words, the uncertainty of where to go, what to do, it scared us the most. Every person there had no idea what was happening. We were trapped in a nightmare. As the chaos unfolded inside the concert hall, the musicians of Picnic, the band scheduled to perform, were forced to abandon their hopes of taking the stage. Their representative, Yuri Chernyshevsky, confirmed that they left the building shortly after the attack began. 
When asked if the band was safe, he reaffirmed the fear and uncertainty that had engulfed the city by responding, how much safety can there be at this point? We hope we're safe. By 8.30 p.m., a massive fire raged inside the concert hall, its flames devouring the once vibrant space. Thick black smoke billowed from the roof and explosions echoed within the building, their origin unclear amidst the chaos. Outside, the scene was a chaotic tableau of flashing lights and urgent activity. Dozens of ambulances, police cars, and fire trucks bathed the building in neon blue as emergency responders raced against time to save lives and extinguish the inferno. The Russian National Guard arrived, their specialized forces combing the area in search of the gunmen. Authorities announced that the attack had resulted in deaths and injuries, although specific numbers were not immediately available. The incident was swiftly classified as a terrorist act, and investigations were launched to uncover the full extent of the tragedy. As the night wore on, various officials from Moscow Regional Governor Andrei Vorobyov to Interior Minister Vladimir Kolokoltsev arrived at the scene to assess the situation and coordinate the response. Meanwhile, security measures were tightened across Russia, and large-scale events scheduled for the weekend were canceled as a precautionary measure. In St. Petersburg, two malls were evacuated amidst heightened concerns. As the sun rose on Saturday, the full extent of the tragedy that had unfolded at Crocus City Hall became increasingly apparent. The death toll continued to rise as more bodies were discovered amidst the charred remains of the concert hall. Stairwells and restrooms, once places of respite, had become grim scenes of loss and devastation. Surprisingly, President Vladimir Putin, who had secured his fifth term in office just days before, remained silent throughout the night. Meanwhile, speculation swirled both within Russia and abroad as to who was responsible for the brazen attack. Ukrainian authorities, who had been embroiled in a conflict with Russia for over two years, swiftly and vehemently denied any involvement. Their denials were quickly backed by U.S. officials, drawing a sharp reaction from Russian officials. Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova questioned the basis for the conclusions drawn by officials in Washington, stating, on what grounds officials in Washington in the middle of a tragedy are making conclusions about someone's non-complicity? If the U.S. has or had reliable information about it, they should immediately pass it on to the Russian side. If they don't, then the White House has no right to hand out absolution. Amidst the ongoing discussions and denials, an affiliate of the Islamic State group claimed responsibility for the attack. However, some Russian state media personalities dismissed the claim as fake, suggesting it was an attempt to mislead investigators. The situation remained shrouded in uncertainty. Russian authorities, on the other hand, sought to tie Ukraine to the attack. The Federal Security Service, FSB, later reported the arrest of four gunmen in the border region of Bryansk, alleging that they were en route to Ukraine and had contacts on the Ukrainian side. Although details of the manhunt were not disclosed, the FSB commended various law enforcement and security agencies for their coordinated efforts, revealing that a total of 11 individuals had been apprehended. The terror acts and its consequences. And in his first video message since the attack, President Vladimir Putin called it a barbaric terrorist act. It wasn't until Saturday afternoon, more than 19 hours after the attack began, that President Putin finally addressed the nation. In his address, he condemned the attack as a bloody, barbaric terrorist act and expressed his condolences to the victims and their families. He also cast the enemy as international terrorism and vowed to deal with everyone involved in the senseless attack of his people. In his words, all the perpetrators, organizers, and those who ordered this crime will be justly and inevitably punished. Whoever they are, whoever is guiding them, we will identify and punish everyone who stands behind the terrorists who prepared this atrocity, this strike against Russia, against our people. However, he stopped short of directly accusing Kiev of orchestrating the attack. While giving an update on the manhunt for the perpetrators of the Moscow concert massacre, he said, they tried to hide and move towards Ukraine, where according to preliminary data, a window was prepared for them on the Ukrainian side to cross the state border. Although President Putin emphasized the need for a thorough investigation to uncover the truth behind the attack, he notably did not mention the claim of responsibility made by the Islamic State affiliate, leaving room for further speculation. Despite the gravity of the situation, President Putin did not announce any immediate drastic measures in response to the attack. Speculation had been rife that he might lift the moratorium on capital punishment, initiate another wave of mobilization into the army, or even escalate hostilities in Ukraine. However, his measured response left many Kremlin critics questioning the government's next steps. 
Meanwhile, in swift response to Putin's claims, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky denied the allegations of Ukrainian involvement in the Moscow shooting and went on to say that it was typical of Putin and other thugs to try and shift blame. Ukrainian military intelligence spokesperson Andriy Yusov also reaffirmed that Ukraine had nothing to do with the Moscow attack while speaking to Reuters. He said, Ukraine was of course not involved in this terror attack. Ukraine is defending its sovereignty from Russian invaders, liberating its territory, and is fighting with the occupier's army and military targets, not civilians. Amidst the heated back and forth between Russia and Ukraine authorities, the updates from the site of the Moscow massacre sent the whole world into a state of mourning. Moscow Regional Governor Andrei Vorbyov claimed 133 bodies had been recovered from the rubble in 24 hours, while doctors were still fighting for the lives of 107 people. As the nation grappled with grief and uncertainty, the Moscow Department of Health began the arduous task of identifying the deceased victims. The process was expected to take at least two weeks, prolonging the agony for the families awaiting news of their loved ones. Consequently, Saturday was a day of mourning, with events canceled and flags lowered to half-staff across the country. The nation stood united in grief, paying tribute to the lives lost in this senseless act of violence. At the burned-out and smoldering Crocus City Hall, a steady stream of mourners arrived throughout the day to lay flowers at a makeshift memorial. The charred remnants of what was once a place of joy and celebration now stood as a somber reminder of the tragedy that had unfolded. Meanwhile, at the Basmani District Court in Moscow, a heavy police presence was evident as four suspects from the Moscow shooting awaited their pretrial hearings. Dalardzon Mirzoyev, Saidakrami Rachabalizoda, Shamsidin Fariduni, and Mukhamad Sobir Faizov, all citizens of Tajikistan, stood before the judge, their faces bearing the visible marks of severe beatings endured during their time in custody. Mirzoyev and Rachabali Zoda, in a surprising turn of events, admitted guilt for their involvement in the attack after being formally charged. The admission sent shockwaves through the courtroom, leaving the victims' families and the public grappling with the realization that the perpetrators had acknowledged their role in the horrific act of violence. However, questions surrounding the treatment of the suspects during their interrogation have cast a dark shadow over the proceedings. Russian media reports have alleged that the men were subjected to torture by the security services. Unverified and brutal videos of their interrogations have circulated on social media, further fueling concerns about the methods used to extract confessions. They appeared to be badly beaten prior to that appearance uh, in court. One of them had a major bandage over his ear following Russian media reports that his interrogators might have cut off part of his ear. Another one was wheeled into court in a wheelchair. As the court proceedings continued, the physical state of the suspects became increasingly apparent. Mirzoyev, Rachabalizoda, and Faridouni displayed swollen faces and heavy bruising, serving as a haunting reminder of the violence they had endured. Faizov, brought to court from a hospital in a wheelchair, sat with his eyes closed throughout the proceedings, attended by medics. He wore a hospital gown and trousers, bearing visible cuts from his ordeal. Despite the gravity of their crimes, the courtroom scenes have still sparked outrage and condemnation from human rights organizations and the international community. Calls for an investigation into the alleged torture and mistreatment of the suspects have grown louder, with demands for transparency and accountability in the judicial process. Outside the courtroom, the reactions to the Moscow concert attack have been marked by grief and solidarity. Russia observed a national day of mourning, with flags lowered to half-mast across the country. People from all walks of life placed flowers at makeshift memorials, paying tribute to the victims and expressing their condolences to the bereaved families. Entertainment events were canceled, and television programming and advertising were suspended as a mark of respect for the lives lost. Members of the rock band Picnic, who were scheduled to perform at the concert hall, laid flowers in front of the venue, their hearts heavy with sorrow. They joined the nation in observing a moment of silence, acknowledging the senseless and unimaginable cruelty of the attack. In between all of this, the death toll from the attack was raised to 137, with at least three of the victims being children. The sheer scale of the tragedy has left a lasting impact on the survivors and the wider community. Stories of narrow escapes and the desperate measures taken to survive have emerged, 
painting a vivid picture of the terror that unfolded that night. World leaders, including Pope Francis, have condemned the attack as a cowardly act of terrorism. The Pope offered prayers for the victims and their families, calling for the conversion of those who organized and carried out such inhumane actions. The international community has expressed solidarity with Russia, standing united against the forces of terror. However, moving on from the grief and global outpouring of love and support, several questions remained unanswered. Like how did the gunmen manage to bypass the tight Russian security? And who were the hidden figures behind the attack? Who else was involved? There is no whatsoever any evidence, and in fact what we know to be the case is that ISIS-K is actually um, by all accounts responsible for what happened. The claims of responsibility for the Moscow concert attack by the Islamic State, ISIS, have sent shockwaves through the nation and the international community. The ISIS-affiliated news agency, AMAK, released a photograph of four men it said had carried out the attack. Investigative journalists have noted that the clothing worn by the detained suspects matches that of the men in the photograph, further solidifying the connection between the attackers and the terrorist organization. The video released by Amak, purportedly filmed by the gunmen themselves, provides a chilling glimpse into the moments of terror that unfolded inside the concert hall. Blurred faces and garbled voices can be seen and heard as the assailants fire assault rifles, leaving inert bodies strewn across the floor. The video also captures the start of a fire, adding to the chaos and horror of the scene. A U.S. official speaking on the condition of anonymity confirmed that U.S. intelligence has gathered information supporting the Islamic State's claims of responsibility. The intelligence community, known for its rigorous analysis and assessment, has found no reason to doubt the authenticity of these claims. This confirmation adds another layer of complexity to an already tragic event. The U.S. Embassy in Russia had previously issued a warning to Americans, advising them to stay away from concert venues due to the threat of a terrorist attack. This precautionary measure highlights the ongoing concern about the Islamic State's ability to carry out acts of violence on a global scale. Prior to the tragic incident, the U.S. government had shared information with Russia about a potential terrorist attack in Moscow fulfilling its duty to warn requirement. This exchange of intelligence underscores the collaborative efforts between nations in the fight against terrorism. However, despite these efforts, the tragic attack on the concert hall could not be prevented. The confirmation of the Islamic State's involvement raises questions about their motives and the implications of their presence in the region. It also underscores the need for continued vigilance and cooperation among nations to combat the threat posed by extremist groups. In response to the claims made by the Islamic State, the U.S. government has strongly condemned the attack and expressed solidarity with the people of Russia. Secretary of State Antony Blinken issued a statement expressing their deepest condolences to the families and loved ones of those killed in this heinous crime. The U.S. government stands united in its condemnation of terrorism in all its forms. While there is no known threat to the United States emanating from the Moscow attack, U.S. law enforcement officials remain vigilant and continue to monitor the situation. The focus now shifts to supporting Russia in its efforts to investigate the attack, bring the perpetrators to justice, and prevent future acts of terror. As the investigation unfolds, the world awaits further details about the motives and connections of the attackers. The United States government, in particular, has been forthcoming about sharing security intelligence with Russia, as evidenced in their warning of a planned attack in Moscow. They have also continued to emphasize that ISIS bears sole responsibility for the atrocity. However, Russian officials have bristled at public comments made by the U.S., asserting that Russian investigators must be allowed to conduct their own findings. President Vladimir Putin, in his pledge to punish those behind the attack, has focused on the arrest of the four suspects and their attempted escape to Ukraine. While Ukraine has strongly denied any connection to the attack, Putin has made no public reference to ISIS's claims of responsibility. Instead, he has emphasized the need to target those responsible for the deadly shooting, regardless of their origin or identity. Dmitry Medvedev, the deputy chairman of Russia's Security Council, has echoed Putin's sentiments vowing to pursue justice for the victims and their families. He has spoken of the need to meet death with death and has even raised the possibility of reintroducing the death penalty. These statements reflect the nation's determination to ensure the safety and security of its citizens in the face of such heinous acts. Right now, efforts to enhance security measures and prevent future attacks have become a top priority. The Russian authorities are conducting a thorough investigation into the attack, seeking to uncover any potential accomplices or networks involved. The need for increased vigilance and intelligence gathering has become paramount as the nation grapples with the evolving threat of terrorism. 
The tragic events of the Moscow concert attack have exposed vulnerabilities and highlighted the importance of robust security measures. The Russian government, in collaboration with international partners, is working tirelessly to strengthen its counterterrorism efforts. The focus is not only on apprehending those responsible for the attack, but also on preventing future acts of terror. However, while the people of Russia may have been united by his tragedy, the aftermath of the Moscow concert attack has also left a profound impact on the collective psyche of the nation. The sheer scale of the tragedy and the brutality of the attack have shaken the Russian people to their core. The loss of innocent lives and the scenes of terror and chaos have left an indelible mark on the survivors and the wider community. More importantly, it has dealt a heavy blow to the aura of invincibility that has surrounded Putin for so many years. For years, Putin has produced projected an image of strength and control, positioning himself as the guardian of Russia's stability and security. However, this brazen act of terror has exposed vulnerabilities within the nation's security apparatus, raising doubts about the effectiveness of Putin's leadership. Critics argue that the attack highlights a failure in intelligence gathering and counterterrorism efforts. They question whether Putin's focus on projecting strength has come at the expense of addressing underlying issues that fuel extremism within the country. The attack on the concert hall has shattered the illusion of invincibility, leaving Putin's strongman image tarnished. In the wake of the attack, public sentiment has shifted. The Russian people, once united in their support for Putin, now demand answers and accountability. They question whether their leader can truly protect them from such acts of terror. The attack has exposed a vulnerability that strikes at the very core of Putin's strongman image. Putin, in response, has vowed to bring the perpetrators to justice and strengthen security measures to prevent future attacks. However, the damage to his reputation has already been done. The attack on the concert hall has shattered the illusion of an impenetrable leader, leaving Putin facing one of the greatest challenges of his political career. How will Putin respond? The Russian president appears willing to fight to the end, and expectedly, in the wake of the devastating terrorist attack at Crocus City Hall, all eyes turned to Vladimir Putin, eager to see how he would respond. However, his initial reaction left many perplexed and concerned. Just three days prior to the attack, Putin had addressed intelligence warnings from Western governments, dismissing them as outright blackmail and attempts to intimidate and destabilize Russian society. The U.S. Embassy in Russia had specifically warned of imminent plans to target large gatherings in Moscow, including concerts. This information was shared with Russian authorities as part of the long-standing duty to warn policy. Yet Putin seemed to brush off these warnings, attributing them to the same Western special services that he believed were behind the attack. Instead of acknowledging the gravity of the situation, Putin shifted the focus to the ongoing conflict with Ukraine. In his remarks to the Federal Security Service, FSB, he emphasized the war in Ukraine as the most critical aspect of their work. He linked any mention of the terrorist threats to efforts by the West to weaken Russia, suggesting that the same Western special services were behind the manifestations of terrorism. This attempt to connect the attack to Ukraine was not surprising, given Putin's previous rhetoric and actions. He has consistently portrayed Ukraine as a threat to Russia's security and has used the conflict as a rallying cry for the nation. By framing the attack as a consequence of Ukraine's actions, Putin sought to divert attention from any potential security lapses within Russia and maintain the narrative of an external enemy. Furthermore, the Kremlin instructed state media to emphasize traces of Ukrainian involvement in the attack, as reported by independent Russian outlet Medusa. This deliberate effort to shift blame and create a narrative of Ukrainian provocation further fueled tensions between the two countries. It is worth noting that labeling every attack inside Russia as a false flag operation, a decoy launched by Russia's security services, has become fashionable. Ukraine's military intelligence agency even went so far as to call the attack a planned and deliberate provocation by the Russian special services at the behest of Putin. While evidence of such involvement remains inconclusive, it highlights the complex dynamics at play. Putin's response to the attack, with its dismissal of intelligence warnings and attempts to connect it to Ukraine, raises questions about his priorities and motivations. Critics argue that Putin's focus on external threats allows him to divert attention from domestic issues and consolidate his power. By presenting Ukraine as a suitable enemy, Putin can maintain a wartime logic of expediency 
and justify his actions to a population concerned about their security. Experts predict that Putin, known for his ability to spin crises to his political advantage, will seize this opportunity to consolidate power and erode democratic institutions. This would certainly not be the first time Putin would be applying such tactics to maintain his stronghold over the people of Russia. In the aftermath of the 2004 terrorist attack in Beslan, Putin's response was not to reform Russia's security agencies or hold independent inquiries into the security forces' actions. Instead, he used the tragedy as a catalyst to roll back nascent democratic reforms. Direct elections of regional governors were canceled and replaced by presidential appointments. Single mandate districts in the Duma, the last bastions of independent voices, were abolished. These actions further centralized power in the hands of Putin and his loyalists. Given this precedent, it is likely that Putin will use the terrorist attack at Crocus City Hall to further empower the Federal Security Service FSB, in its hunt for enemies, both real and imagined. The attack has already led to the addition of the LGBT movement to the list of terrorist and extremist organizations, further stifling dissent and targeting marginalized communities. Putin's response may also involve attempts to divert attention from the tragedy. Wartime creates its logic of expediency, and autocratic regimes obsessed with their survival often seek to replace the prospect of real evil with a more suitable enemy. By shifting the focus away from the attack, Putin can maintain control and justify his actions to a population hungry for security and stability. It is unlikely that Putin will escalate attacks on Ukrainian cities and civilian infrastructure, as Russia has already faced international condemnation for its actions in Ukraine. The timing of the attack, just hours after Russian missile and drone strikes hit energy facilities across the country, raises questions about the coordination and intentions behind these events. Putin may choose to avoid further escalation and instead focus on consolidating his power within Russia. This move has become pertinent due to the fact that the attack at Crocus City Hall has raised concerns about the state's ability to protect its citizens. While Russia's vast security apparatus is primarily focused on regime protection, recent reports have highlighted the increasing number of politically motivated prosecutions and the erosion of democratic freedoms. In a country where counter-terrorist special forces chase commentators from the internet for criticizing Putin or reporting on sensitive military operations, terrorists may feel emboldened. As the investigation into the the attack continues, Putin will face mounting pressure to address the underlying issues that allowed such a tragedy to occur. However, experts predict that he will prioritize maintaining control and diverting attention from any potential security failures. By leveraging the attack to strengthen his grip on power and further erode democratic institutions, Putin can ensure his survival in a challenging political landscape. Nothing points more to Putin's priorities and motivations than his dismissal of intelligence warnings, which could have prevented the senseless loss of lives had he chosen to act on the intel. However, Putin chose to whip up conspiracies about a gang up on Russia by the West. Now, by framing Ukraine as a suitable enemy, Putin can maintain a narrative of external threats and rally the Russian people around a wartime logic of expediency. As the investigation unfolds and the nation mourns, the implications of Putin's response will shape the future of Russia. Will he address the underlying issues and strengthen security measures, or will he prioritize consolidating his power and maintaining control? Only time will tell how Putin will navigate this critical moment in his leadership. To be one step ahead by receiving details of the events unfolding in the coming days right as they happen, ensure to click on the card showing on the screen.